we will discuss uh, logical clocks. In the asynchronous system model, we do not have access to physical clocks. All we have is the causality between events happening in the system on different processes. Still, we can design a form of logical clocks that capture the notion of causality. We present two logical clocks, Lamport logical clocks and vector clocks. A clock is a function t from the events in the system to a totally ordered set and this set could be for example the set of all positive integers such that if event A happens before event B and happens could happen at real time or because of causality then the clock increases which means that the value of the clock at event A is strictly less than the value of the clock at event B. We are interested in this relation to be they happen before relations, so causally before relation. So let us remember again the happen before relation. It's a relation on execution and traces, and it's called sometimes causal order. And if two events, A and B, occur on the same process and A occurs before B on that process then we say A is before B and if A is an event of sending a message and B is the event of the delivery of the message and A happens before B and the relation is transitive. Now two events A and B are said to be concurrent if it is not the case that A happens before B nor B happens before A and we draw this like this. This means A and B are concurrent events. Again, here's the happen before relation. Event E1 is before event E2 on the same process. Event E1 is a send event and event E2 is a delivery of the message. And here that the relation is transitive. Okay, There are some intervening events that are causally related between these two. So now, how to locally tell if two events are causally related? Remember, we are in the asynchronous system model, and causality is all what it matters. So the first type of um, clock we are going to define is called Lampert clock. And let us see how it works. Here are Lampert clocks. So each process has a local logical clock, it can be kept in a variable, we call this variable tb for process p, and it is initially zero. When a process b sends a message, it adds or piggybacks the pair, which is this logical clock tp and the process identifier on every message sent. So now let us look what happens if the process performs certain events or actions. If the event A is an internal event, then first the logical clock is incremented and then the process performs the internal action or the internal event A. If the event is a send event of a message M, then again the, the process first increments the clock and then sends the matches together with the timestamp the pair T, P, and P. And if the event is a delivery of an event A having the message M and the timestamp T, Q, a delivery event from process Q, then the logical clock is incremented as follows. You take the local clock of process P and you take the clock in the message that's coming from Q, you take the max of these and you increment it by one. And after that, you perform the event A. So observe that the logical clock is updated before executing the action associated with the event. Let us now see how to compare two logical clocks. First, observe that the timestamp TP is unique because the process ID is unique for each process. Now we compare timestamps, which are 
pairs as follows. We say that this pair is less than that pair if and only if the following conditions hold. Either the logical clock TP is less than the logical clock TQ, or in case they are equal, then the process IDP is less than the process IDQ, which means that we use process identifiers to break ties. Here is an example. This pair is less than this because 5 is less than 7. And this pair is less than that one because, first of all, the logic clock 4, they are equal, but we have considered that the process ID of P2 less than the process ID of P3. So what property Lamper clock uh, guarantees? It guarantees that if event A happens before event B in an execution or a trace, then Lamper clock of event A is strictly less than Lamper clock of event B. So how can we see this? We can see this by taking the different cases. The first case, when the two events happen on the same process, and the second case with one event, A is a send, and B is a delivery of the message. So let's take the first case. So we have events A and B occurring on the same process P, and we know that Lamper clock is strictly increasing w on each event. So if a is before B, then Lamper clock of A is before Lamper clock of B. Now, if A is a send event with the Lamper clock TQ from process Q, and B is a delivery event, then TB, the delivery event, is at least one larger than TQ because we take the max of the Lamper clock of the receiving process and TQ, and then we add one. Therefore, TB is at least one larger than TQ, which is the Lamper clock of event A. Transitivity follows from the case that if event A is before event B and event B is before event C, then the logical clocks TA will be less than TB and TB will be less than TC but this is a total order therefore TA is less than TC which implies that the logical clock of event A is less than the logical clock of event C. So let us see an example of an execution. We have three processes P1, P2 and P3 and this is the virtual time of execution, this one, and we perform one event at a time. So here is P1 doing an internal event, so it increments the clock by one. Then P1 does another internal event, so it increments the clock by one again, so the clock is two. And here P1 is performing ascent, so the clock is incremented by one, and this value of the clock is sent in the message. Then P3 is performing an event, so its clock is incremented from 0 to 1. And now we have the delivery of the message. What do we have here? We have a message which carries the clock with the value 3, and we perform a max operation, taking 3 with the current value of the clock at P2, which is 0, and then we increment this by 1, and this gave us the value 4 that we see here. Then P2 performs another increment because it's performing then a send event. This, by the same reasoning, will lead to the clock at P3 equals 6, and then the last event we see in this diagram is process P1 performing a local event and it increments its local clock. So now, as we said earlier, if event A happens before event B, then 
lamp o'clock of A is strictly less than lamp o'clock of B. If we just take this property and think of what we are saying here, but we take the negative of this, this is saying something if, if some property P implies Q, which is the same as saying if not Q implies not P, this is saying also that if TA is greater than TB, then we know that A cannot influence B. This is, so A cannot influence B. That's what we say. So by comparing the logic clock of two events, we can tell if one does not influence the other. However, the converse is not true. It is not the case that if TA happens before TB, that we can include that event A happens before event B. This we cannot conclude. And you can see it here. You can see, for example, that in a situation where this event has a lamp clock of four, and this event has a lamp clock of six. But so four is less than six. But in fact, these are concurrent events. Therefore, Lamport logic clock cannot distinguish between causally related and concurrent events. This leads us to the study of vector clocks.